much, Dr. Ponzio, and I, it's been a real pleasure uh, getting to know you and uh, as of last evening and today, um, so many of your colleagues who share the kind of commitment that Research America, myself and my colleagues and our board um, have, we all share this commitment to making research, uh, especially research for health, thinking of biomedical applications, a higher priority in this country. And we've got a ways to go to really get to the point where we're putting science to work at the level it can deliver. We know there's a lot of individuals who aren't getting funded, who aren't having their chance yet to make a difference, and we want to change that. And people are waiting and anxious for it to change. Um, but that's, that's what we're all about. So uh, this happens to be a uh, lecture series, if you will, from our point of view at Research America, uh, that's funded by the Cadlin Foundation, uh, which you may have heard of because they give Nobel-like prizes um, in Norway rather than in Sweden um, every year or every other year for some of them. But they also have a commitment to public understanding and science communication. So that's how we're connected. I mentioned our mission. Uh, we are an alliance uh, that have now been at work on our mission for 29 years. I haven't been there the whole time, but I was part of the founding group as an advisor. And Rutgers is a member of our alliance. We thank you for that, along with um, many others from across the stakeholder community is the way we talk about our alliance. Uh, we have a fantastic board with five former members of Congress including former Congressman Rush Holt from right around here, and, and I know that many of you know him, um, and other leaders. So I uh, tip my hat to all of you, to the science communication commitment that is uh, very alive and well here uh, across the many campuses, and I look forward to more opportunities to working with you. I think what you're doing is really something that all of our research-based universities around the country could well um, afford to do more of, and I use that term loosely, afford, um, find a way to afford doing more of. It will really make a difference for science. So when we talk about communication and public engagement, we often use the word advocacy. And we use it um, intentionally to make it clear that we're trying not just to inform in a, if you will, neutral way, but rather to make the case for it, to strongly and we hope effectively convey the value of science. And that means building relationships, sharing all the things you can read here. But what we think is a mistake, and has been for a long time, a mistake in the science community, is this idea that we can just outsource that function somehow. That it's other people that will make the case for us, that will speak for us. Whereas, in fact, we're probably the most authentic voices and the most persuasive ones at that. So, advocacy does work. And this is a list of things that we've been involved in. A lot of other organizations, individuals, and institutions were involved also. This is by no means um, advocacy, especially when you're working with public policy, is not something you can do by yourself, any one person, any one organization. But you'll recognize many of these things um, as important to your work and that of your colleagues and going forward. Um, advocacy uh, that we participate in also sometimes includes inside the Beltway, just right around Washington, um, advertising. So whether that's through social media or literally on buses or metro stops, um, it's intended for the people who work in the administration and who work on Capitol Hill. So this was an ad that we uh, uh, ran with funding from a number of scientific societies, uh, including the AAAS, um, but across the sciences, not just uh, biomedical sciences, on a very technical policy, and in this case, funding issue. We had to work on raising the budget caps 
to get over sequestration, totally inside Washington Beltway speak, um, in order to have enough money there to allow for better funding for science agencies, <coughs> and everybody else, by the way. Um, but the, the, the whole premise is raising the budget cap. So there's a reason we didn't run this um, advertisement all over the country, all over New Jersey, because it would have been meaningless to 99.99% of the public. But we do do this kind of thing inside the Beltway. Um, okay. Sometimes advocacy is, um, inner, is considered it, as being the same as lobbying. And in everyday parlance it is, you know, just in the general use of those terms. But again, back inside the Beltway, there's actually quite a big difference. Lobbying um, requires registration. Uh, you're paid, uh, individuals and companies, law firms typically, are paid to be lobbyists for particular interests. And there's uh, nothing wrong with that, despite some of the bad press that lobbyists can get. Um, we do some lobbying, but actually very little. Nonprofit organizations are allowed to do some, but not a lot. So as long as you keep it into, uh, keep it as a minimum percentage, that's just fine. People in the science community, typically, um, can be and should be, we say, advocates, but rarely are lobbyists. And stepping into being a lobbyist without having it be part of your job description is a mistake. It can get you at uh, the wrong end of an angry phone call from someone in your administration. Uh, it boils down to this, knowing that if you are an employee or student at a university, you're probably not being paid to be a lobbyist. And if you are, you know that. <laughs> if it's part of your job description, you know, you know you're a lobbyist. And that means that you can speak for the university. Other people, as part of their job descriptions, not just lobbyists, can speak for the universities. Of course, your whole administrative structure, et cetera. A member of the science faculty or post-grad student or someone else can't speak for the university, but you can and should speak for yourself and for science and not be afraid to do that. Um, advocacy right now in this past couple of months um, has been extremely successful at the finish line, if you will, of the budgets for many, not all, of the science agencies that were funded for fiscal year 19, which started October 1st. They were funded for the first time in 22 years. They were funded on time uh, on September 28th, just before the fiscal year started. The first time in 22 years. Pretty amazing. When all we hear about the Congress is that it's gridlock, can't get things done, arguing all the time. But actually, most, not all, but most of the science agenda in Congress is bipartisan and not being fought over, nor is it the real deal breaker in passing uh, multi purpose legislation like funding for a new fiscal year across all the government. But we think it's really important for science to be a player, if you will, in the decisions for that process, rather than an afterthought, which goes back to that advertisement, if you will. But the big success, which is due to a lot of people being involved in a lot of organizations, is making sure that that did pass for the first time in 22 years. And it resulted in, in the health age, the relevant health agencies, relevant to our work, um, in those in increases that got them to those new totals. But today was the first day that the, the Congress came back for the so-called lame duck session after the election. So some of the people who are sitting in the Congress today know that they're not coming back to town in January. But they still have votes between now and then. And there are some pretty important things coming up, including funding the rest of the government. There were some parts that weren't funded by September 28th, and that was mostly held up because of the president's interest in building a wall. Whether or not that actually happens, 
before the December 7th cutoff date that is the current deadline for funding the rest of the agencies and departments. Uh, whether that happens or not by December 7th remains to be seen, but it's generally thought that uh, it will, everything will be wrapped up and this Congress will get out of town and then turn things over to the next Congress with a clean slate. Um, it often is not what happens when Congress turns over, but there is some hope that it will. We think today, the second point I'm here, Dr. Kel Kelvin Drogemeyer, uh, we think he's going to be confirmed today on the Senate floor to head the office, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. That would be a very good thing. Dr. Drogemeyer <coughs> is the Vice President of Research at the University of Oklahoma. He's an atmospheric scientist who's very well qualified for this position. Whether that happens or not, we won't know until it really happens, but it looks very positive. And that would raise the profile of that office, which has been um, understaffed uh, and really has done almost nothing for two years. So we're looking forward to that. But it's been a lot of advocacy push behind it to get back to the advocacy agenda here is, is a piece of it for sure. I should just say while I'm talking about him, that it's not the same office as the president's science advisor. Often those two things do correspond, and they're in, uh, in one person. But it isn't, and it's not written down any place, it's not a law or even necessarily history. Um, our current president, President Trump, does not have a science advisor. Uh, but the head of the Office of Science and Technology Policy could function <coughs> like one. We, we will see if that happens. Um, next. Okay. So looking forward to the new Congress. Here's some things that we've been talking about along with um, a lot of folks in our <coughs> alliance. I think it's really useful to keep in mind that there are over 100 new members of Congress. That's quite a lot with the House and the Senate combined. And that means 100 opportunities to cultivate new champions, if we haven't done it already. It's always nice to cultivate people before they get elected, but that actually is uh, something that hasn't happened yet for the science community. We haven't organized in a way to effectively reach all the candidates running every couple of years. But that's certainly uh, a goal that we uh, participate in strategizing for and sometimes working on as time permits. Um, the downside is that we're losing a few champions. Not the, uh, I would say not the most critically important champions. We didn't have any uh, <coughs> friendly leaders in the Congress abruptly lose races. But there were a few people that we've said goodbye to, including uh, we will be saying goodbye when they leave at the end of the calendar year. Uh, so, um, Mr. Culbertson in Texas, who is heading the Science Committee, and um, the, uh, uh, Mr. Yoder of Kansas, who is a strong proponent of biomedical research. But in his case, Yoder's case, is replaced by somebody who's reputed to be equally enthusiastic about biomedical research. So you can read the rest of this. I already talked about sequestration budget caps. It's the biggest threat right now um, to robust funding for science going forward. Um, it's a self-inflicted wound that the Congress inflicted on itself in 2011. Nobody thought it would actually go through, that they would make agreements and avoid these artificial draconian cuts. But they're back, unless they get put aside by law. So that's very much on our mind and should be on yours. So here's some uh, graph of NIH funding over time. And you can see it in both appropriated dollars in the blue line and then adjusted to the CPI here. <clears throat> if sequestration remains in place, that artificial strange cap thing, and the president um, persists in his cuts that he's recommended for the last several years, and they're accepted, that's the kind of cut we see in the NIH budget. It's almost 25%. Um, and that's in 
appropriated dollars. This is in CPI, what it would, what it would buy you in, um, in dollars would be adjusted to about what it was buying in 2001. Imagine what the pay lines would be if it went through. And we don't think it will go through, but it could. It could. Um, CDC, same thing. Horribly underfunded, the CDC has been for years and years. Um, and uh, in for, it has had a very rocky appropriations um, history in the last few years. Uh, the National Science Foundation, same story. There's a lot at stake right now and a brand new Congress to address it. Um, a lot to be worried about. Meanwhile, um, as we've been taking things for granted in science in so many ways over the last couple of decades, other nations have been ramping up. Now, that's a good thing for other nations, and a good thing, I would say, globally, a good thing for the world. But the idea that we're some kind of invincible, forever global dominant leaders in science is not only silly on the face of it and contrary to history, but you can see that uh, we're very near the point. No matter what happens this year um, in the Congress or this coming year, China is poised to overtake the US in overall R&D spending. And it's going to just keep going have an announced goal to be most dominant in the world. And as I said, that's not a bad thing, especially if we're all working together. But that's not intuitively the case, or necessarily the case by any means, we're all going to be working together, let's face it. Um, and it's even worse than that. This is from the perspective of policymakers who don't like to see this. They're really interested in the US maintaining their global lead, and yet they're the very people who are deciding we're not going to. It does take resources. This would look very different if we were talking about defense budgets. You know what they look like, right? Um, there's another way of looking at the US share of global R&D, going back to 1960, where we were overwhelmingly the big kahuna, and where we are more or less right now with steady shrinking. Now, as I said, there's good news and bad news to this. But the idea that we're going to maintain our prominence and drive our economy as a big share of the world economy without investing in r and is not going to happen. It just won't, things will not work out well. Um, so this becomes a powerful argument for many, many policymakers to hear. So our former chairman, who was uh, the leader in the House during the time that the NIH budget was doubled, John Porter, um, is fond of speaking to the science community, you all and your colleagues, about getting involved and making sure that you're reaching out to Congress, making connections, not being invisible, if you will. Um, and we know from the public opinion surveys that we commission on a regular basis, and I want to emphasize we commission them, we don't conduct them, despite our name, Research America. Uh, we've been doing this for a long time, uh, 25 plus years. And we can see that members of the public think it pretty important for scientists to engage policymakers. Overwhelmingly important when you add very important and somewhat important, which you always should, in public opinion survey because there's evidence to show that there's some uh, parts of the population will never say the most extreme, very important. They'll never pick five in the scale of one to five, et cetera. So it's very important to combine on both ends of the spectrum. Now, those similar percentages also say that it's very important for scientists to inform the public, which gets to the science communication theme that uh, many of you are active in, and we are as well. The public overwhelmingly has that expectation of being informed. Um, and I really love this one. Uh, this is A lot of this work is from earlier this year, but we'll be updating it uh, the first part of next year. 
Um, don't expect many of these things to change significantly, these outcomes. How about this? Do you agree that public policies should be based on the best available science? You're on the face of it. Everyone should say yes, of course. Um, it's sort of hard to know what the people who say they disagree are thinking about. Maybe that there should be other factors as well as science involved, and that's a good point, I'd say. But to me, one of the striking parts of this is how it's across the major, the two major parties with an expected dip from independents who tend to be anti-government to begin with, so you expect that. Um, but I would ask you to think about our public policies based on science. Uh, not, not so much. Can't count on that. And by the way, when we ask people which public policies should be based on science, it's absolutely everything you can think of. Everything. Education, law enforcement, uh, banking, infrastructure, the list goes on and on. Um, so this, we don't usually see big increases over just a couple of years, as we did here, two and a half a year stretch, um, with more people saying it's important that elected officials listen to scientists. That's another invitation, it's an expectation of the public that elected officials listen to scientists. Okay, so can scientists make a difference? Yes, and there's a lot of anecdote about this, and, and I know I was talking earlier, some of you were talking about how to, how to gather all these stories to show the science community as well as public officials the difference that being informed by scientists about science can make in your votes in Congress, in your decisions on public policy. So our chair right now, former governor and congressman Mike Castle, was instrumental as a moderate Republican in assuring that stem cell research went forward back during the George W. Bush administration. And he's still very active on this topic and others. And often will suggest taking a scientist to help persuade a member of Congress um, or other official. So I mentioned earlier that um, most science, not all science issues, but most science issues actually have very strong bipartisan support. And you can see this when you visit the campus of the NIH. These are the buildings that are named for former members of Congress. And you can see the approximate split between Republican and Democrat. <coughs> We're very fortunate at Research America to have worked with the majority of these people. Um, at one time or another, many of them serving on our board. Now, if you know the NIH campus, or even if you don't, you can look at the map. There's a lot more buildings. They currently have numbers that could have names and some empty space for some new buildings. So the kind of champion who really takes uh, an, a budget of an agency like NIH to new levels, who gets their name on a building, for example, exists in the Congress today. And they haven't for many years, but they have appeared in leadership roles right now. And these are their names. So. Um, Senator Blunt and Mr. Cole deserve to have, and I believe will have, buildings on the NIH campus named for them after they leave office, which I hope is not in my lifetime, mm -hmm. because they're doing great things where they are right now in Congress. But that's the kind of champion we're looking for, and we have them, and we just say it again, we have them right now in the Congress. And you'll note where they're from, I hope, and that they are Republicans. Uh, Mr. Cole, of course, um, will now not be in the majority in the new Congress. He will be the ranking member of this committee if he stays on it. He may not, he may move to another committee. But the good news is that the ranking member, Rosa DeLauro, uh, will, is also a champion, is also a person whose name could be on a building in an age. Um, so, We've got some great people in place right now that um, we hope will stay there for a very long time to come and continue to make NIH their number one priority. But speaking of members of Congress, so I've got a little um, exercise for you. So imagine that you're in Starbucks or some coffee spot 
wherever on a weekend and you're in wherever you vote, whether it's around here because you live around here or wherever you live, your member of Congress is also in that Starbucks getting some coffee. Okay? So raise your hand if you recognize that person by sight. Mm -hmm. This is great. It's got maybe half, which is more than usual when I give this test. Okay, now raise your hand if your member of Congress recognizes you by sight. <laughs> one, one. That's about average. Just for another one. Yeah, well, you're going to have to get to know somebody else. Um, one, having one person, whether it's a group about this size or three or four times this size or smaller, if there's one person that's unusual, most of the time there's none. That is a problem. People in the science community who vote, for the most part vote, for sure, who are using taxpayer funds locally, who have a lot of interest in public policy, of every reason for a member of Congress to know who you are, are invisible to your member of Congress. And that's what they tell us when we're on Capitol Hill. We're never approached when we're back in the district by people who live there and vote there, either who are scientists or who care about science and bring it up to us. Never happens. They're approached all the time by other people, bankers, small business owners, etc. Science community does not have this in our normal um, culture of how to engage with a member of Congress. We might, some of us, send a letter. Two of us out of hundreds and thousands might send a campaign contribution, another thing worth thinking about doing. Um, but approaching someone and knowing them enough that they know who you are needs work. Needs work can happen. These are some people I recognize. Not everybody lives, you know, two houses away from this building and votes here. But some of your members of the New Jersey congressional delegation, two of whom are not going to be returning, as you know. Um, but it's worth getting to know these people. And if you don't know who they are, it's very simple. You know, just get right on the web. We get telephone calls sometimes, emails. Can you help me find out who my number of Congress is? Do you know how easy this is? You don't have to call us. You can ask Siri. <laughs> you know, it's, it's really simple. Um, there's one very important member of Congress right now in your area who is likely going, he has been the ranking member, the top person in the minority on the Energy and Commerce Committee, which is the authorizing committee for the NIH, among other things it does. They passed the 21st Century Cures Act a few years ago. Um, he is likely to become the chair of that committee. He's hugely important to us all, right here, and needs to hear from you and know you, know you, and know how much you want him to succeed, and that uh, you are happy to support him. And um, you know, the easier ones. You know who these people are? I didn't know whether we'd be changing this one up or not. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the will of the people of New Jersey has been heard. Um, typically, people uh, recognize their senators more easily, but they're even less likely to say that they know them, that the senator recognizes them by sight. Politicians want to know you, by the way. They want your support. So that leads to, what would you say scientists and elected officials have in common? Anybody has room again? Yep. Data. Data? Sometimes polling data, right in the case of the Congress. Yeah. They need the support of a majority of people in order to continue their jobs. Yeah. That's it's beautifully said. Um, serving the public's interest. And they're subject to the public's interest, which is really the point you were both making, I think, at all. That's how you start a conversation that you're in by surprise with this person you recognize as your member of Congress. By the way, you could be wrong. It's not 
funny. But they're going to say, oh, yeah, people, people think that I'm a member of Congress. It happens all the time. I'm not. So what? It doesn't matter. But so you strike it you know, right, and that is Frank Cologne, sure enough. And you're tongue-tied, you don't know what you're going to say. This is what you say. Thank you for serving the public's interest. Thank you for your leadership. You know, I serve the public's interest, too. And then he's going to say, tell me what you do. And you will tell him, including the fact that you're, you and Rutgers using public dollars on behalf of the public's interest, etc. This You don't need to memorize a script. It's really simple. You're serving the public's interest. And they will take it from there, gladly. Now, there's a puzzling and not very good thing that selected members, and we could put all of New Jersey's congressional delegation on here, but would all say no. These folks are not members of the NIH caucus. What's a caucus? There's hundreds and hundreds of caucuses in the Congress for every interest on earth, for um, uh, road paving, for penguins, for um, tooth, uh, brushing your teeth, for, I mean, for everything. And there's one for the NIH. Becoming a member of a, con of a caucus means you can put it on your website that indicates that you care about this issue. Why would you care about this issue? It's because your constituents have told you that they care about this issue does not obligate you to vote in any w one way or another. Uh, you don't have to show up at meetings, unless you're the chairman of a caucus. Um, there are many members of Congress who literally are part of hundreds of caucuses. It's all because their uh, constituents ask them. So when we see something like this, we know we've got a problem, that we don't have activity by people in the state that are as simple as asking in numbers of more than three or four, but even if we just took everybody in this room and asked your members, now don't bother with Bailey Nelson and Lance, but ask them to join the NIH caucus and to let you know after they have uh, and follow up to find out if they did. That could make a difference. Among other things, a difference in getting more dollars for NIH to New Jersey. You are not punching at your weight here in New Jersey. Your state legislature should have this data, and you ought to send it to them. Um, because for your population rank, 11, you ought to be showing up as at least 11 on funding from these agencies. But you don't, as you can see. And I, you can see the other, just a couple of states that are punching ahead of you for their own weight. And there's more, obviously. There's many more. And that kind of argument, not that it should be block granted, that NIH should be block granting their funds to every state based on population. But how about having some goals to lift our state up? That typically appeals quite a lot to governors, to state legislatures, and two members of Congress. But they're not even a member of the, the caucus for NIH. They're not paying attention, I can assure you. And they may not realize that uh, the state is not punching by its way. It's not moving up as it should be in attracting more grant support here. Because there's a lot of brilliant science here. There's a lot of proposals that aren't getting funded. We don't mean for them to interfere in that process but to be watching it more. Makes, makes a difference, and it really makes a difference for state legislatures that start offering more support for science in the state to track more science in to sustain that that's here, et cetera. So things to do now um, include that ask about joining the NIH caucus and include completing the FY19 budget. There will be more things. You can find them on our website um, up to date once we get the new Congress on board. Um, lots of specific asks that you can easily do in, by social media or an email to your member of Congress. Easy, simple things to 
uh, raise the voice of the science community in advocacy. Um, here's some tweets, simple kinds of things that go to this FY19 budget. Um, welcome to take a screenshot and do it. These are the deciders. Uh, it's at the point now where these, these things are out of committee. It's going to be decided by the top leadership in the Congress. Oh, a moment for screenshots. <laughs> Plus, plus, this whole slide deck is all you <laughs> have. Um, so, what, this goes to the point of the data that politicians pay attention to. Okay. Uh, Abraham Lincoln's quote, Abraham Lincoln, the very same president who chartered the National Academy of Sciences, which he did in 1863, also had a keen ear for the public. What's the public thinking about? What does the public want? How do we align with that and make good things happen? This is the reason that we commissioned public opinion surveys to keep a finger on the pulse of the public when it comes to attitudes towards science, science questions, science-based institutions, scientists. Um, I was talking about China, it's leave, um, escalating investment in research in order to enhance its leadership. People in this country want the United States to be a leader, period, in everything, by the way. Um, they think that basic research is necessary. This is a question, word for word, that was first asked by the National Science Board in commission studies back in 1983. The percentage of people who support this, strongly agree plus somewhat agree, has changed almost not at all since 1983. When they stopped asking the question, we started asking it because we wanted to make sure that a negative trend wasn't developing. <coughs> it's not. Despite uh, repeated um, uh, times that I hear scientists, basic scientists tell me or telling each other, well, the American public doesn't support basic science. There is no evidence for that. So how about on another kind of science altogether, social determinants of health. The American public thinks this is very, very important. It's getting almost no funding support at all. We're working hard on this particular um, kind of science right now, along with a lot of other people. Um, on a different, I'm giving you all different, scattered all over um, kinds of data that we have much deeper um, uh, sources of much more on similar topics that you can find on our website. Or if you can't find what you're looking for there, you, can, you should contact us. Um, it's, a big, it's a big problem trying to recruit people to clinical trials. So we've been asking a lot of these kinds of questions around that topic. And you can see here that in terms of a broad um, sample of the public, people think they should be hearing about clinical trials a lot more often than they are from their doctor. Um, people also are willing to share their data, which is very interesting. We, we're seeing trends of this willingness to share go up a little bit year by year, every couple of years, sharing it for a variety of reasons. This is a, a way people can be involved in science themselves, the sort of citizen science model, if you will. Um, lots of times we hear, oh, yeah, people don't want to share what information about themselves. Some people don't. That is true. Uh, but most people do. They're looking, they're waiting to be asked. They want to be involved. Um, this is not our survey data, but we have similar data. But we I use it to illustrate that we, uh, in addition to commissioning surveys ourselves, we pay a lot of attention to what other people are doing in this area. So this is Pew data about trust, who you trust. Um, and you can see that the military, this has been true for decades, military right on top, medical scientists, scientists, um, you can read the rest. Uh, and there are different arrays sometimes offered, but they always come out more or less the same. So the point is, scientists come out very well, very much toward the top. The difference, however, between scientists 
and in the me and the uh, military, for example, is number one, scientists don't wear uniforms, at least not in public, uh, so they're harder to spot. But it's also not part of the culture of science to be visible. Invisibility is actually the preference. So this, this is a question. The actual question is, can you give me the name of a living scientist? When we first asked this question, we said, can you give me the name of a scientist? And guess, guess what we got? Okay. Uh, Einstein. We still got a <laughs> small, tiny. Think about what you imagine the general population response to this question, okay? The truly, now this was taken before Stephen Hawking died, so you don't count the fact that he died. Um, the important percentage is this 84%, we just outright say no. That percentage hasn't changed for over 20 years. Some of the names have changed. Occasionally, there's a woman. Isn't she a popular woman? No, she's not. Okay. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, occasionally, there's a woman. Usually not. But some of those names have changed over 25 years, almost 25 years. But this has not. That 84 percent is terrible. People aren't even just aren't even guessing and being wrong that they're not a scientist. I mean, there are some of that. I mean, the tiny one person said. You know, my next door neighbor was wrong, you know, but maybe they're right. Um, yes, okay. Now we switch from science broadly to medical and health research. And now we're looking for a place. This is arguably an easier question. Okay, can you give me the name of some place, any place, where medical or health research is conducted in this country? Okay, you got your guesses. Two-thirds of the American public just say <coughs> no. They don't say records. They don't say my state's um, university or medical school or whatever. They, those who can name something respond to national marketing ad advertising. Marketing. You can see the names so. there. Um, sort of good news is that the NIH when we started asking this question 20 years ago, it was 4%. Still more than we are. Absolutely. And it's um, the bad, bad news is this. It hasn't budged. Two thirds. Two thirds. These are actual metrics of visibility. We are failing badly. Um, it's one more that I won't make you go through the process on. You can see immediately how important this one is politically. So just to the best of your knowledge, would you say that medical research is conducted in all 50 states, which it is? Only a quarter say yes. Only a quarter. So why are we surprised that when we have trouble rounding up support for medical research, because we have to work at it every day, all the time, very hard, why are we surprised that people in the Congress say to us, nobody in my state really cares? I never hear about it as a voting issue. I'll vote for it because I actually believe we should cure cancer and find an answer to Alzheimer's, but it's not because it's my constituents' interest in voting for me. This is a problem. And if you're ever tempted to think that the idea program or the EPSCOR programs that give special set-aside funding to states that aren't, quote, science-rich is a bad idea. You're wrong. <laughs> this is the, the reason it's a good idea. Um, this is from a group called Science Counts that we've done a lot of work in, work with, and are uh, more and more presenting some of their data. Uh, but this is also a very disturbing question that, um, Half, 52%, don't link U.S. leadership in science to their quality of life, and only one in four see government's role in science as important. That's very, very disturbing also. Kind of fits with the rest of the invisibility 
data. So what are we going to do? And I'm going to wrap up with just a few slides about how to change the conversation, um, other than finding out who your member of Congress is and getting in touch with them. Um, there's lots of things you can think about doing. And some of them I know you already are, actually. Um, science cafe kinds of activities, very, very important. Small business people who you work with, because they're vendors or they're associated with you and want you to succeed so that they succeed, may never have, you. maybe you personally or somebody um, and your team and your department or whatever has never talked to them about the importance of who they elect in Congress matter, making a difference to their ultimate success as your vendor because you can succeed, science succeeds, the university succeeds. In other words, they've never connected the dots. They typically are very happy to know that and to uh, consider it when they're voting other things. You can reinforce each other in advocacy. But there are people who've had bad experiences talking, trying to make friends for science. And I'll bet most, if not all, the people in this room are in that number, where you run into skepticism. Why should I believe you? Why should I believe science? You know, I don't know whether it's often about food or drink. Red wine is good for you or bad for you or some surgical procedure or uh, therapeutic is good or bad. That's actually people thinking like scientists. They're being skeptical. Our advice is when somebody is asking you what amounts to a difficult or a skeptical question, to label it as such and say, you sound skeptical. That's the way I was trained to be skeptical. We have that in common. It's good to ask questions. I do that all the time. And then you end up, you're talking about the process of science without necessarily labeling it that way. But you can diffuse what might otherwise evolve into an argument about somebody being right and somebody being wrong, and the scientist saying, you don't really understand. And as soon as you say that, you've lost the person who doesn't have science training, let's say. He's got other things to think about. And really, basically, the one part. So this change of, of changing the conversation into being about you rather than being about me is uh, the underlying premise of all good communication and, and certainly all advocacy. Because we end up too much of the time telling our story, the story of science, rather than telling your story the story of the person who wants science to succeed, wants to understand what's going on with their tax dollars, whatever the question is. And meeting those needs is really the key. And there's a whole list, this is just part of it again from Science Counts, about words that work and words that don't. Needless to say, big, long scientific words do not work at all whatsoever. They're not even on here. But some of these are a little more subtle and they're more about attitude. Um, we have this message frame called Then, Now, and Imagine. It's very easy to remember. You don't have to memorize anything. Just accept Then, Now, and Imagine. It's a way to align with people's aspirations, something they have in common with you, even if they have absolutely no science training or even interest. But they can relate to things in the past that weren't good that now are good or pretty good. Let's take HIV AIDS. Back in the day, HIV AIDS diagnosis was a death sentence period. People died. Now, thanks to this nation's longtime commitment to science, including basic science, most people with a diagnosis of HIV AIDS in this country are going to live a relatively healthy, like long life with a chronic disease, kind of like diabetes. Imagine if we could defeat HIV AIDS, put it in the history books forever, and diabetes too, and a number of other long uh, chronic conditions and infectious conditions, like the list goes on. The point is you want to quickly remember people of what science has accomplished 
but get them into thinking about the future as quickly as possible um, so that they will, like you, want science to succeed. And you can apply it to pretty much everything. We do workshops with people hands-on until they get really comfortable with this. Um, but I can assure you that it's a great way to get into a conversation, whether with a policymaker or a member of the public. Sometimes people complain about there being too much money spent on research or too much money being spent by the government anyway or whatever. It's good to have a few things just in your back pocket um, to help describe how much a lot of money is compared to what. We have, this is a very wealthy country. We spend money every day on things we think are important. Thanksgiving's coming up. Um, you can see a comparison here. We can make the comparison to pretty much anything that's closer to what your work is doing. It might not be, have anything to do with the FDA, but you can take one of the centers at NIH or anything else. And it helps people to see, oh, so maybe all that money, all that much money, is not so much compared to other things. Another way of, well, let me first show you this one. Sometimes people in the science community are tempted to argue against the defense budget or to say, we could just have a little slice of the defense budget to do science. We could do so much more. Well, first of all, the defense budget is already funding some science. Let's not forget that, including medical research. But secondly, that's one of those aspirational goals that you don't mess with the security of the country. People expect that, and they want that, and they will support it. But how about having a country worth defending? A healthier country, a better educated country, a country with better infrastructure, right? You don't have to take on the Defense Department. You can align with it. It's a very good advocacy move, I would say. And here's some, speaking of defense, some comparisons that startle people, startle people. You could argue, if you didn't talk about the rest of the context, that spending $2,000 per person in this country per year is a good bargain to keep us safe, to defend us. Why wouldn't we spend that much on keeping us healthy through medical research, et cetera? But no, we're spending a tiny fraction of it. Does that all add up to raising taxes? Probably. Probably does. Uh, we're not afraid to talk about that, and we know the science community. We're already starting to hear from some people about that going into next year, because we know the debt is rising. There'll be a lot of conversation about debt and deficit. It's the wrong time to be giving in before you start. Fight for the dollars that we know the public will support. So there's now, this is about putting your face on science and research, not being afraid to do that, and not being afraid of the four most important words that you can say to people around the Thanksgiving dinner table who uh, you've had numerous bad experiences with trying to convince them about the work you do being important, or even understanding it, science, or a stranger on an airplane you're meeting for the first time, and they say, okay, so what do you do? What is it you do again, you know, Thanksgiving table? You say this, I work for you. This is the serving the public's interest message. And then you stop, you say, I work for you. You're gonna ask questions. And that's when you listen and respond to those questions because you'll know the answers and you'll also be humble about it if you don't. And you'll make a convert for you and for science. It happens all the time. We get testimonials from people who are me or one of my colleagues talk about trying this out. People who they say in their family who they have arguments for years about spending money on science that they don't understand, they don't have any idea what this person is doing, turn it around into I work for you and made a convert. People who have gone to their place of business and gotten up petitions to send to their member of Congress to support research at their local university because they had no idea research was happening there. 
until they talk to somebody and they're plenty of that. This is important. This is a big message. It's also my final notes, because I'm very lucky I work for you. <laughs> so, yeah. and some questions? I'd love to have questions, comments, not yet. I'm, I'm puzzled by the uh, importance of research Republicans and Democrats. I'm, yeah. I'm a registered Republican. Mm -hmm. And I say that I'm embarrassed at this point. <laughs> but, uh, you know, my impression reading the papers and seeing the media yeah. is that um, the registered Republicans today have a very low opinion of science. Um, uh, it depends on what kind of science we're talking about. Yep. The, um, I don't know, of course, what uh, survey data or other reports you might specifically be, re uh, be referring to. There's a lot of anecdotal speculation going on about elitists. There's some, there's some data that shows that people have less confidence in higher education than they used to. That is true. That has nothing to do with science. That's, uh, or it may, but that's not what the question is. The question is about higher education. Um, and then there's speculation that the public has lost confidence in science, but there isn't any data. It, it's worth paying attention to anecdote and to, to media, whether it's, it's fake news or anything else. If it's really permeating the environment, it's going to cause damage. So I take your, your point two ways as a signal a possible problem out there, but also just let you know that there is an okay. so. um, From my observations on social media and from discussing with other scientists and, and mm -hmm. confirming what I'm noticing, um, there seems to be this tackling of how do we work with this administration to champion these things, but the instant this, this administration puts mm -hmm. up, like, we want to do this, you get these severe people who hate this administration to say, since they like, since the administration likes this, that's bad. Right. So, and I understand that this, this administration is temporary and we need to remember that every single day. Mm -hmm. But how do we as scientists moving forward for hopefully the next two years, mm -hmm. move forward in positively advocating for science and for scientific funding so that if the Trump administration was to give us what we want, we're not having to deal with a general population who views that so negatively yeah, and yeah. hurts our overall goals. Yeah. Well, I, if I may say, you might be overthinking the problem there. I do that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I am a scientist. Okay. Okay. Um, I, there's a lot packed into your question. Uh, including about you know what will people think if we align with or uh, against the administration? The um, I don't think people think about it that much to begin with. The science community might. There is um, uh, plenty of evidence that the science community is uh, overwhelmingly Democrat in political preference. We had an example of it's not 100 percent, and of course it's not, but overwhelmingly. So um, it was true, it's been true for a long time. And I remember when uh, Al Gore was vice president and famously saying, you know, uh, I don't need to work, I don't need to go to any universities, I don't need to work with scientists because they're all on board, you know. And, and people on the other side of the aisle at that time say they never wanted to go to universities because nobody there liked them or would welcome them. And that kind of perception about the communities is damaging to us, frankly, to the science community. So playing down any, any perceived partisanship is extremely important. Taking victory dances because Democrats won the House is a terrible idea, really. It's about working together. And um, if you're worried about the administration's budget cuts, which everybody should be, um, remember that it's a proposal President's budget is a proposal. He has any no president has power to enact that. It's all the Congress, and it's dead on arrival, and it's been dead on arrival for presidents from the beginning, because it is the Congress that makes the difference. There is a bully pulpit 
advantage that the Congress doesn't have about the budget. And the budget's going to be bad again. Unless Kelvin Rodemeyer prevails magically. So I didn't really answer your question. I mean, maybe gave it something to think about. I was wondering the New Jersey lagging in usage money. Is that a matter of um, ratio of universities to population? Because we really don't have, we only have doctors in Princeton that are our one institution. Um, it might play, it might be a factor in there, but it's so striking that um, I doubt it's the whole thing, but I, I haven't done the analysis. And I, I can tell you from talking to a lot of universities around the country and to when I get the chance, state legislators, if this knocks their socks off seeing this kind of data, well, how their state fares compared to others, and it can stimulate a lot of investment, which is the best thing, that's what you want. And it gets the attention of congressional people, too. So explaining it is important, but um, thinking big, you know, aspiring to more is also important. And there's some states that, looking at similar kind of data decades ago, decided they weren't going to take it anymore and started investing and watched things improve. Ohio did that. Michigan has done that. North Carolina previously. Florida. Florida had kind of a failed experience with it, um, but I'm told it's back for more. Your point, your, your point, yeah. Just to clarify, do you mean that the state started invest, investing yes. in its universities? Yes, yes. Instead of slashing the funding, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And in building, you know, building a new science campus, um, in, in <coughs> investing in their universities, yes. And, and part of that, there's this argument, you know, p keep up with your population ranking. Another part of it is keep your homegrown, talented kids here at home. And that's very popular with voters, state voters. So that's another argument. Yeah. Any idea why Frank Malone's not part of the United States? No. I'll bet you nobody's ever asked. Mm -hmm. But I assume many of you will. Huh? Yeah. And if he says, oh, that's a terrible mistake, I am. Say, oh, great, glad to have that corrected. Maybe, you know, we'll, you know, they don't like to be wrong, so. <laughs> <laughs> and they'll change it that day. Good, good. Right. Okay, maybe that's it. Thanks so much. Thanks again. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, outside in the hallway.